Welcome back to another video on using Nina. In this one, I switched computers and I'm using the one in my observatory to show you some more features of the advanced sequencer, and in particular, the use of templates. As we said in previous videos, once you have optimized a set of instructions for your imaging tasks, you can save them as a template, and this allows you to form new sequences very quickly. So in the advanced sequencer and under templates there are the three default templates that come with Nina and there are several user templates which I've created over the last few months and I put a little number in front of them that reminds me of the order in which they are used because you can use several templates at the same time in a sequence. So for instance there's one to start up the observatory, there is one to capture some images, and there's one to shut down the observatory. And that looks very simple, but when you go into them you find they're a little bit more sophisticated than they first appear. And that's what I'd like to do in this video. And we're going to examine the contents of these three templates and the sequences they represent to see some of the more sophisticated types of controls that you can do. As we go through these three, it's important to realize that this is just one way of achieving the ends that I require, and there are other methods as well. So I have a startup observatory sequence, and that runs until the target is ready for imaging. And then I have the imaging sequence, which is here. And then after that's completed, I do the shutdown of the observatory. Of the three, this last one is the easiest to go through. If I expand it, it's just a linear sequence of stopping what it's doing, parking, closing the shutter, and disconnecting equipment and warming the camera. There's a little icon here that we should just take note of. On the Park Scope tab, if I expand the menu, you can see that um, if after one attempt there's an error, it will abort the sequence. I've got a choice of continuing, skipping the current instruction set, abort, or skip to end of sequence, which is already the end of sequence. So abort is just a precaution, although I'm fairly certain that the shutter closing mechanism automatically checks for the scope in a safe position. If I shrink that down, we can take a look at the opening startup sequence, which is a lot more sophisticated. If we expand it out, we can see it's made up of a lot of instructions. So let's just shrink these down so we can see the overall structure. So it's formed of four sequences. One connects the equipment, which is fairly straightforward. The next opens the roof and initializes the mount. So this is a paramount and it needs to be homed before it can be slewed to anywhere. So I wait until it's safe I open the roof, unpark the scope, find the home, wait for a few seconds and park the scope and then cool the camera. The reason I park the scope is that the park position gives clearance to the roof so if I do need to shut the roof quickly there's no scope in the way. If I shrink that down, um, in fact just before I shrink that down you'll notice that these little icons are popping up so if the safety icon doesn't seem to be working properly it will abort the sequence. So if without a safety system working, it will abort. The same is true if the dome doesn't open or close properly, or if the park command doesn't work, or the unpark command doesn't work. Because without these working, you can't do the sequence. The find home is slightly different in that if it doesn't find home, what it does is it skips to the end of sequence instructions, where it just gets rid of, you know, parks the mount and shuts everything down. So let's roll that back up again. And equally, the last park scope command equally has an abort after an error so that there's no point continuing. What we have now is an open observatory. The mount knows where it is, but it's parked and the camera is cooling and it's slowly reaching ambient temperature. The next section is a little bit more sophisticated and it comprises of several loops. So again, I'm going to collapse some of the loops so you can see them. So it loops until we get to dusk. And in that loop is a safe wait loop, and then there's a close during unsafe loop. 
So if I expand those out, the loop first of all goes through this and it will continue to loop around this whilst it's safe. And all that does is a redundant operation to open the roof, which because it's already open has no effect this time round. And it waits a few seconds and then tests to see whether the loop condition is still safe and it'll go around this endlessly and it'll do that until we get to dusk. If, however, conditions become unsafe, then if I just scroll down a little bit, it jumps into this set of sequences. So it parks the scope, it's already parked, or it should be. It closes the observatory and waits until it's safe again. And again, waits for a time span to just be sure it's good. And then it will pop round and then open the roof, wait for a time span and go around this whilst it's safe. So the combination of these things creates a situation that while the conditions are good, the roof remains open and everything cools down and reaches ambient. As soon as the conditions worsen, the scope is made safe, the roof is closed and it waits until it's safe and then once it's safe and it's still before dusk, it opens the roof again and carries on. So the exit of this loop is the condition that we reach nautical dusk. And so when we reach nautical dusk, it comes out of this loop and into the next instruction. And this instruction is quite simple. It's a holding pattern. It simply waits until conditions are safe and then it opens the shutter. So if conditions are already safe and the shutter is already open, it just skips through these in a matter of milliseconds and moves on to the imaging sequence. And that's what we're going to discuss now. And again, like some of the other commands, if there's a problem, it aborts rather than tries to continue on because if the basic controls of parking the mount and closing the roof are not working properly, then you're putting the imaging system at risk of poor weather. The imaging loop is the most sophisticated part of all. And if we expand this out, it's gonna take a few seconds to show, but what I'm going to do again is shrink down the sub loops so you can see the overall structure. So we have some target information that hasn't been populated and we have a main loop that has three loop conditions. It'll loop until we get to dawn, it'll loop until the altitude sets below an absolute altitude of 40 degrees and also loop while the altitude is above the horizon. So these three loop conditions work together so whichever comes first, either dawn or the altitude is less than 40 degrees, or the altitude is less than the horizon, causes this loop to stop going round and it will carry on and do the shutdown sequence. So keep that in mind because this will continue to go around these three sets of sequenced instructions whilst these conditions still hold good. So let's take a look at the first. As the title suggests, it re-centers the target. So the first time round it centers the target, but like the startup conditions, if there's a problem with the safety monitor saying conditions are unsafe and it temporarily shuts down, it may need to recenter the target. So again, a fairly straightforward linear selection of instructions to stop the guiding, switch the filter to luminance, wait until you're above the horizon, which is a useful thing because while we're at dusk, the actual image itself, the target may not yet be over the horizon. So it wait, this is the thing that holds it and doesn't try to go any further until we can actually physically start taking pictures because the, the target has enough altitude. There's an annotative note. It waits until safe as precaution. It opens the shutter. Again, these are skipped over if these conditions are already good. Unparks the scope. Slews to the, the, the target coordinates runs autofocus to make sure the, sh the stars are nice and definite and then it does the slew and center. There's a little bit of redundancy here but that ensures that we can autofocus in the vicinity of the target and then tidy up and center accurately on the target and then it says start guiding. So that recenter command is fairly straightforward but sometimes this is executed more than once and the reason it's executed more than once is the acquisition loop, which is this one here, is while safe. And if I just expand out the bottom one, if it's unsafe, it goes again into one of these holding patterns. So 
Similar to the one we saw earlier, there's a loop while unsafe. It stops guiding, parks the scope and closes the shutter and it waits for a time span. So all the time it's unsafe, it goes through this cycle. But obviously if the scope's already parked and the guiding's already stopped and the shutter's already closed, it has very little effect. So to stop it whizzing through this loop really quickly, there's a one minute delay. And when it becomes safe again, it pops back out of this set of commands, goes round to the beginning again, and then hits the recenter command, which guess what? It opens the, the roof, unparks the scope, recenters it. So these three work in combination of each other to make sure that we acquire data when it's above the horizon and whilst it's safe to do so. The last part of this imaging sequence is the acquisition. So if we expand that out, you will see what we have done here. So it's actually not overly complicated. There's a loop while safe, which makes sense because if it's unsafe, you want it to pop out and, and go into the close routine. And there are a number of triggers. So I've got autofocus triggers, restore guiding, meridian flip, center after drift. That's an interesting one. So if you have some temporary clouds come over and the guider loses track and the telescope drifts slightly and it becomes too excessive, this will automatically recenter the, the mount. Um, autofocus after a period of time, that's a sort of catch all. So if for whatever reason it hasn't autofocused for a period of time, it does it as a precaution. It's a, a worthwhile insurance policy. And then the instructions. We've got smart exposures for red, green and blue filters. Now, what I've done in the past is I've created two sets of these instructions. So I've, I've typically done a red, green, blue set, which I use for stars, and then I've done a narrowband one for um, hydrogen, sulfur and oxygen emissions. And the difference between them isn't just the, the filter, but I have different times and often I use different gains on the camera. So what I'll do is typically have a set of red, green, blue and a set of hydrogen, sulfur and uh, oxygen. So I'm going to just get rid of that for a second and show you that. Ah, I just pressed the wrong icon. Some of these icons do look quite similar, especially on a small screen. This is the save template icon and this is the bin icon. And I shouldn't have pressed either of these two and I've created a new template called acquisition while safe. So I don't need that. And I'm going to delete that by dragging it to the bin. And then what I should be doing is scrolling up to the top to this high level repeating target acquisition and then deleting that one. And then I can bring in a slightly different target acquisition sequence, which bears a strong resemblance to the previous one. There's some subtle differences about it. But this one has narrowband and red, green, blue stars targeted information. So there's long exposures with high gain for the narrowband and shorter exposures with low gain for the stars. And they're put into groups so that I can easily reorder them. The other thing that you might want to do, and again, it's purely sometimes just a, an insurance policy, is after these acquisition loops, it might be sensible to make sure that the guider has stopped. So to do that, I would simply say instructions, guider, stop guiding, and it will put an instruction down here. And then all I need to do is say save and it will update the template. So my target acquisition template is now being updated with a little safety net to make sure that I don't accidentally guide somewhere. One other little thing to note is that if you want to save a new template rather than just overwrite an existing one, all you have to do is just change its name. So for instance, if I just put the word test after this and then hit save, it appears as a new process. And with this, I'm just going to have a little play. So one of the beautiful things about templates is that they don't have to exist in their own right. You can combine templates. So for instance, if I wanted to do this one here and say, calibrate my guider at low declination, this has now taken an existing template and has put it into 
this sequence which I now can save and update as a new type of process template. And this now incorporates other elements. So you can build up your templates like a stack of cards and use them interchangeably. Um, and this particular one is quite interesting. It's one I use for calibrating the guide. I don't need to do it every time. But it basically again has a loop while safe and for one iteration to make sure it goes through once. It unparks the scope, slews to an altitude which is basically on the celestial horizon facing south. Um, it switches the filter to luminance, it runs the autofocus and then starts guiding but it says force calibration on and that forces PHD2 to calibrate its guider. It then stops the guiding and parks the scope. So another little useful nugget that you can apply um, and then reapply or not have it in your sequence at all by just hitting delete. The next series of videos are going to be about the imaging tab and while I can talk about the structure of the imaging tab in the next video I can't actually show anything running because I have a week of cloudy skies ahead of me. So it may be a little time before we get to see all this in operation and how you interact with it in real time. Anyway, thanks for watching.